The question that I want us to just consider today is, do you make convictions, do you develop principles and convictions based upon your circumstances, the opportunities that God places before you? Uh, do you develop convictions just because of, of, of the moment that you're in? Uh, you, do you choose your, your, who you date, uh, who you marry because somebody actually likes you and they, they happen to meet or exceed your expectations of good looks? Or do you choose your dates based upon what God says is true? Uh, whether they draw you toward Jesus? Uh, do you take a job just because it's available, because it pays more, has a, a, a better perk? Or do you take a job because it fits who God created you to be? Are you the type of person that just jumps from green pasture to greener pasture? Or are you the type of person that develops your convictions and, and, and principles based upon what God says is true? Uh, the more I study scripture, the more I realize that, that, that leaders and their convictions are made, not, and, and made and tested not on the mountaintops but in the valleys of life. Uh, we don't develop character in, in times of strength, but in times of weakness. And it's in those moments of, of weakness that our character and our principles and convictions are tested. We've been learning a lot from David about leadership, about character, about heart. Uh, David is a man who's been appointed king, uh, but he's not yet king. He's in this weird situation where he has this, this rule, this kingdom ahead of him, but he's not yet there. He's in this in-between moment. And I think as Christians, we too are in this in-between moment. Uh, scripture actually tells us that we are being prepared to reign along with Jesus. Do you ever think about that, that you're being prepared to rule? That's interesting. Uh, 2 Timothy 2.12 says, if we endure, we will also reign with him. Revelation 5.10, uh, you've made them kingdom priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. Revelation 26, they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with them a thousand years. Revelation 22.5 uh, says, night will be no more. They will need no light of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. We're being prepared to reign with Jesus. Now, I know that can be a touchy subject, and there's theologians that disagree about the timing of all that. Uh, but, um, you know, I, I believe that the, the, uh, a straightforward, historical, grammatical, literary interpretation um, says that our reigning with God will be ultimately fulfilled sometime in the future. But in the meantime, in the meantime, whether you agree with my timing or not, God is using our everyday circumstances to prepare us. To prepare us. And the most important thing for us to realize uh, is, is that God is preparing us, especially when we want kingdom right here and right now. Uh, God's purpose, uh, new heavens, new earth, no more tears, no more pain. But there are tears and there are pain right now in this life. And our temptation is to try to circumvent pain, to circumvent tears, to circumvent um, the hardships with unfaithfulness to God. Uh, Jesus had to deal with that exact same temptation in the garden. Remember, after fasting 40 days and 40 nights in the wilderness, Satan came to him and he tempted him. If you are the son of God, here's these ways uh, to have the kingdom without pain, without discomfort, without the cross. And uh, Jesus rejected those temptations each time by quoting scripture, um, even though Satan quotes scripture to him, which is interesting too, but Satan doesn't quote scripture correctly. Jesus does. Um, and he embraced the cross, embraced the pain, despite the temptation uh, to circumvent all that pain and discomfort. And, and 1 Samuel 24, if you have your Bibles, you can turn to these. 1 Samuel 24 is this kind of moment for David. In this chapter, he is being tempted to bypass pain and discomfort and take a shortcut to the throne. And, and just as God worked in David's life, uh, God is also working in our life. Uh, he's the same God then as the same God now. And, and this chapter, although it's history, although it looks back, um, it is given for our reproof and correction and training in righteousness as is all of Scripture. Um, I was trying to think of a title for uh, today's sermon, and, and most pastors pick something pretty straightforward and descriptive, uh, so today's sermon might follow the, the subheadings in your Bible, David spares Saul's life. All right, you're like, oh, you know, I've read that before. But to make it a little bit memorable for you, I'm going to call it David in the Other Throne Room, okay? 
So before God leads David to the throne room, right, he's going to take him to the other throne room. (laughs) I think every leader has their bathroom story. Uh, (laughs) Oh, boy. Um, I I remember growing up, um, uh, my my pastor, I won't name names or anything, but uh, um, he had this habit. He would would do the the introductions and and scripture readings, things like that. And then uh, they would do an offertory, an an instrumental. And during that time, he would sneak off and go out a side door and, and go to the restroom. And he did this every single Sunday, but on one Sunday, I'll never forget it, he forgot to turn off his mic, a wireless mic. <laughs> and we had a different kind of instrumental that morning. And there were no more straight faces the rest of the sermon. Um, <laughs> and so I'm always very careful, turn on the mic at the right time, right? Um, I, I have my bathroom story as well, um, you know, and, and all the... You know, middle schoolers are perking their ears up. Um, it was long before I thought I was a preacher, but it was while I was involved with a youth group. Um, to give you a little background, I had just broken my ankle and I got my cast off. All right, and so I, all through circumstance, I, I broke my ankle, and so I, I had this bad limp. I it was my ankle was hurting, and I was taking the youth group on a, a trip to West Virginia to go whitewater rafting. And, uh, and so I have this bad ankle, and so I laced it up with these big old army boots, you know, to try to, to get by, and I'm hobbling along, taking them on this trip. And it was a large youth group, and so we're driving down to West Virginia, and we stop at McDonald's, right? And so as soon as you stop and you open the doors, all the kids go, and they, they run off, and they try to get first in line. And I'm, I'm closing up the van, and I'm hobbling towards the, the McDonald's, and I get in there, and I see everybody's in line. I'm like, you know, I'm going to take this opportunity and use the bathroom. And so I, I, I go into the restroom, and I'm doing my business, and I'm looking around like, this is kind of a strange little bathroom here. And then all of a sudden, the blood just drains from my face, and I realize I was in the wrong bathroom. <laughs> I was in a stall, and then this is before, you know, uh, you know uh, it, back then it was really inappropriate, you know, to <laughs> be in the, in the wrong uh, bathroom. And I hope it, it still is inappropriate for you. But anyway, I, uh, this particular bathroom had two stalls, and I was in one. And there are 20 or more youth group girls that are finishing up eating. And I realized something about youth group girls is that they don't go to the bathroom alone. They take moral support with them. And, uh, and so I'm occupying one stall. I got these big old army boots, you know, and, and I have this moral dilemma. Do I admit my failure and my weakness and my shame? And do I go out and, and face the taunting or do I wait it out? What would you do? <laughs> I decided I was going to wait it out. And... Uh, And the girls just kept pouring in. And I thought, you know, I I remember thinking this would make a great Seinfeld episode. You could just picture George Costanza just like getting so frustrated. And and they just keep going. And nobody thinks to think, you know, who is blocking this bathroom? And uh, uh, and I I timed it. I was in there over 40 minutes. (laughs) And I got away with it. You know, <laughs> oh boy, I got uh, until now, and now you'll never look at me the same. Uh, you know, nobody likes to talk about what happens in the bathroom, but sometimes bathrooms can be places where leaders are made. Uh, <laughs> I think back in that, that cool morning, and I asked myself, what would Jesus have done? I have no clue. Um, <laughs> uh, despite our best efforts to hide, you know, nothing's hidden from God. God sees everything we do. He knows everything we think, and he can use even our, our most embarrassing, lowest, humiliating moments for his glory. Uh, 3,000 years ago, King Saul walked into a bathroom with David hiding in the next stall. David could have easily killed Saul. He could have, at Saul's most vulnerable moment, he could have even allowed his men to do so. But instead, David uh, allows God to work and he uh, uh, faces up to his conviction, even though it's going to mean more pain and embarrassment for him. And Saul's response to this is going to be really amazing. It's, it's an amazing story. There's intense drama, danger, suspense, and a lot of applications for us along the way. A um, little context, uh, chapter 23, Saul's again pursuing David. He has him in his grasp. The Philistines attack, and Saul goes off to fight the Philistines. And we don't know how much time passes between these two moments, but 
Saul survives and immediately resumes, enthusiastically resumes his manhunt for David. And at the beginning of chapter 24, some unnamed person informs Saul, David is still in the wilderness of En Gedi. So verse 1, chapter 24, it says, When Saul returned from following the Philistines, he was told, Behold, David is in the wilderness of En Gedi. Then Saul took 3,000 chosen men out of all Israel and went to seek David and his men in front of the wild goat's rock. Now, how many men did David have with him? He had 600 at this time. So Saul has a five-to-one advantage. Does David have the best and the brightest and the strongest in Israel? No. He's got the downtrodden. He's got the indebted, those that are bitter in soul. And Saul has chosen men, uh, which implies that these are the best of the best. These are the, 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 the Marines, the, the, uh, the Army Rangers, the Navy SEALs. And, and you know, it, so he chooses them, and 3,000 men go after David. Now, in verse 3, it gets pretty detailed. And he, Saul, came to the sheepfolds, by the way, where there was a cave, and Saul went in to relieve himself, which is a very polite way to say that he had to go to the bathroom. All right? and, and these are the details that we don't typically make stories. Everybody needs to use the bathroom, but we don't like to talk about it uh, because it's, our, our, it's a vulnerable thing for us to talk about. They're usually omitted from our storybooks. But here, this is a very necessary part of the story. Saul feels the, feels the urge of nature, looks for a place where he can relieve himself in private, only it's not private. <laughs> the rest of verse 3. Now David and his men were sitting in the innermost parts of the cave. Right? So Saul goes in thinking he's, he's got all this privacy. You know, he's leaving the 3,000 men outside. He's going to have this, uh, this, this nice bathroom to do his business. And there's 600 men inside this cave hiding out. Now, imagine you're David and his men. You're fearing for your life. 3,000 Marines are coming at you. You're peering out from the cave. You're watching Saul and his army get closer and closer. Uh, you're hoping and praying, don't stop, don't stop. Keep going, keep going. Pass by here. And then all of a sudden, this army stops right in front of the cave. And you can imagine their blood going cold as they see Saul's eyes turn up towards this cave. And they slink back to the inner parts of the, the cave, hands clenching their weapons, silently groaning as they see the most intimidating, powerful man in Israel come up and approach. They're trapped. There's no way out. Saul enters the cave, and they're ready to defend themselves. They're in for it. It's been a wild few weeks, but the game is up. And here he comes, and whoop, <laughs> there he goes. A sigh of relief for Saul, David, and David's men. <laughs> God had delivered David miraculously, and it looks like God is delivering Saul right into David's hands. A miraculous provision. Here's Saul at his most vulnerable, helpless moment. There's no more vulnerable time in your life than when you're using the bathroom. Um, even animals know this. I mean, uh, uh, um, a vet could uh, confirm this, but I've always wondered why it is that the dogs circle, you know, before they use the bathroom and lay down. I think it's because they're scoping out the ground for, for danger. You know, are there snakes here? I don't know. And so they circle around before they, they squat. Um, Saul didn't circle the, the cave before squatting. Now he's vulnerable. <laughs> David's men know this. And the man of David said to him, Here's the day of which the Lord said to you, Behold, I will give your enemy into your hand, and you shall do to him as it shall seem good to you. Uh, you know, and, and this is so fascinating. His men see there is a shortcut to the throne here. Here's a path that is going to bypass all the pain, all the suffering. Here is Saul delivered into David's hand. And notice, too, they're even using God's own words to convince David of this course. You know, we, we don't know, uh, you know when these words were spoken to David. I think they're reflected in many of the Psalms. Uh, Psalm 97, um, he preserves the life of his saints. He delivers them from the hand of the wicked. Psalm 31, my times are in your hand. Rescue me from the hand of my enemies. Make your face shine on your servant. Save me. Oh, Lord, let me not be put to shame. For I call upon you, let the wicked be put to shame. Let them go silently to Sheol. Now, Saul, it, dying with his pants down, would qualify as the wicked being put to shame. And, and we don't know, you know the exact prophecy that David's men are quoting, but it's fascinating that they're using the words of God to tempt David. 
It's important for us. Just because somebody quotes scripture at you does not mean that they are correctly using the Bible. Remember, Satan used the Bible to tempt Jesus. He just wasn't using it correctly. Well, how do you know if it's being used correctly? Well, one key as you're reading the Bible is that the Bible agrees with the Bible. If you, if you take a verse and you take it out of context um, you, you're, and, and, and you're not, uh, it doesn't agree with the rest of Scripture, it's wrong interpretation. And so one of the keys, too, is that, that phrase, use the Bible. Okay, we don't use the Bible. Uh, to use the Bible implies that, that it is a tool that we are over to be, to be used, manipulated. We're not, we don't use the Bible. We are under the Bible. We, we listen to and obey and submit ourselves to the Bible. Satan used the Bible, took a verse out of context to uh, uh, meet his own purposes as a proof text to convince Jesus to take a shortcut to the throne. And Jesus knows all scripture, and, and he is the word made flesh, and he won't take a shortcut to glory because the cross is the means of our salvation. Isaiah 53, he was pierced for our what? Our transgressions, our sin. He was crushed for our iniquities, our sin. Upon him, the, the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. Salvation is through the, 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 the death, uh, through the shedding of blood of Jesus on the cross. And, and Jesus knows Scripture has to agree with Scripture. And so for Satan to take a verse out of context is, is ignoring the truth. And, and this happens all the time. I've heard uh, um, people you know, and, and people use it more and more, try to use maybe Genesis 1, where God says, I've given every green plant for food. And I've heard people say, well, that's a proof text that I can smoke marijuana. You know, and, and you know, it's, it's, it's a green plant, you know, and, and, and God's given it, and so it must be good. And it ignores, you know, every other verse that would speak against its use. You know, first of all, uh, you know, we're commanded to submit to governing authorities. Well, the state says it's okay. Well, the federal government still says it's a, a controlled, you know, uh, uh, you, know sub, you know, it's a Schedule One substance uh, with no medicinal use. You know, there are better, even though people say it's a medicine, there's better medicines that won't pump carcinogens in your lungs. Well, what if the federal government says it's okay? Well, um, 1 Corinthians 10, 23, all things are lawful, but not all things are helpful or beneficial. Um, all things are lawful, but not all things build up. So just because something is permissible does not mean it's good for you. Um, we, as, as the church, we're called God's temple. We're called to take care of it because God dwells in us. Um, uh, and, you know, and I can give you 20 more references against drunkenness. Um, if someone gives you a verse or a situation, that verse uh, it doesn't agree with Scripture, uh, they're wrong because the Bible interprets the Bible. Right, so David's men, they're giving a proof text to support it. And it looks like at first, David agrees with them. He's going to act on it. Uh, at the end of verse 4, it says, Then David arose and stealthily cut off a corner of Saul's robe. Um, you know, and, and this is a major feat. You know, Saul, I mean, he's not fast asleep. You know, his attention is elsewhere, but he's still awake. And imagine that the skill and the stealth as David creeps towards Saul with a, a sword in his hand. And, and, he, and he cuts this corner of the robe, and immediately David feels like what he did is wrong. Verse 5, it says, And afterward, David's heart struck him because he had cut off a corner of Saul's robe. Now, this is interesting because um, did David sin? You know, did, did he actually break uh, a law, you know, or do something against God? Well, maybe not in the technical sense, and he probably could have rationalized it, but David feels a conviction, and we're going to tell you why, but he feels conviction that what he did was wrong. Okay, and the New Testament says that about convictions for us. You know, if somebody has conviction that something is wrong, um, you know, it, 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 we are, that don't have that same conviction for those maybe areas that, that there's freedom to do that, but somebody has conviction this is wrong. If you try to convince them that it's, it's not wrong, um, you're causing a brother to sin, a brother or sister to sin. And so for David, he feels this conviction. What I did is wrong. Like, well, it's such a small thing, David. Well, to him, it's not a small thing. It's not just a, a piece of a garment. You know, it's, it's vandalism against the king of Israel. Right? And so, you know, you know for example, um, you know, it, it's one thing for a, a, a gal to slap a guy in, a, in the face if he says something inappropriate. Totally different if you slap King Charles III. 
All right? it, it, it's, not, it's not the action itself, but who the action has done to. And David feels this conviction. In David's mind, to put out your hand against someone that had been anointed and put in charge by God was to put your hand out against God himself. And so despite what his men kept trying to convince David of and rationalize it, even though David had been promised the throne, even though it looks like the circumstances are all in David's favor, uh, David says, no, God raised up Saul, and it would be God that would remove him. And so even though David's men used God's words to support their point of view, uh, like Jesus did in the wilderness, David counters temptation with God's words. He said to his men, Verse 6, the Lord, Yahweh, forbid that I should do this thing to my Lord, the Lord's anointed, to put out my hand against him, seeing he is the Lord's anointed. So in David's mind, cutting off the robe was him putting his hand against the Lord. And so to David, I was wrong in doing this. And David understood that the God's uh, kingdom, even though uh, the kingdom God said would be his one day, but it is going to be given to him in God's way, in God's time. He's going to say this later on, a couple chapters later, in, in chapter 26, uh, David says, as the Lord lives, the Lord will strike Saul, or his day will come and die, or he will go down in battle and perish. The Lord forbid that I should put out my hand against the Lord's anointed. And so, apparently, this caused some arguments between David and his men. They're like, no, he's right there, he's right there. And, you know, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. Uh, but it says in verse 7, David had to persuade. David persuaded his men with these words and did not permit them to attack Saul. Now, that word uh, persuaded literally means to tear apart. And so, it, almost a play of words, as David cut off the robe, now he's tearing into his men, fiercely defending the life of the king, the one that's hunting them. Um, he's not going to lift his hand, and neither are you. Right? And, and, you know, how they had this argument in the cave, you know, that's a miracle too. But eventually, time is up. Saul arose up and left the cave and went on his way. Now, um, again, the cutting off the robe seems like a small thing. But David experienced guilt. And it's easy for us when, when we can do small things and we feel that, that pang of guilt in our lives to just write it off and say, oh, it's no big deal. But uh, as you grow closer and closer to God, as you mature in the faith, uh, when, when God uh, grips your heart or gives you conviction, be sensitive to that. Right? Um, it, it's no big deal for me to take office supplies from a company that makes millions of dollars every year. No. That should ping our conscience. Uh, it, it's still theft. If you take something without permission, it's still stealing. And so even a small step towards sin and temptation is the wrong step. And, and the closer you get to God, the more you're going to have to come to terms with those behaviors. And so don't overlook the small things in your life. Be sensitive to what God is doing in your heart. He gave you the Holy Spirit for a reason. I remember as a little kid, you know, uh, and parents, you know, do this for your kids. Don't just, you know, uh, ignore uh, those things. You know, it, there are opportunities to teach your kids. My mom did this with me. We went to the grocery store, and as every kid does, I go right to the, the aisle where they have the toys, and I love balloons as a kid. And, and I saw a pack of balloons there, and, and, uh, and uh, you know, and my mom's in another part of the store, and, and they have those little holes where they put them on the peg, and I fished a balloon out through the hole and put it in my pocket. Right? And, and, I, and I got in the car, and I start blowing up the balloon. And my mom's like, Seth, where'd you get the balloon? I'm like, oh, you're at the store. Okay, all right, now, now she knows, you know, what's happened. She turned the car right around, made me go to the manager of the store and say, you know, I'm sorry I stole from you. Right? And, and, uh, and offer to make it right and, and pay for the balloon or the pack and everything. But, uh, you know, don't write off the small things in your life. You know, nobody's perfect. We all mess up. But when you do, don't, don't just push that guilt away. Use it as a prompting from God to get right with him, to get right with others. And so David's conviction can help us as we develop convictions in life. Um, also, with how we deal with leadership. And no matter what political party you deal with, you're, you're in or belong to or no party at all, depending on the election cycle, depending on your point of view, there is going to be a time in your life where you think leadership is unworthy of submission. Um, uh, for, for a time, I thought I was going to have a military career, and I remember uh, it being drilled into me in ROTC and everything else. Uh, you, you, you don't salute the person, you salute the rank. Right? And, and so it doesn't matter if we don't like leadership or if we like leadership, we still need to respect leadership because that leadership was put in place by God. 
All right, Romans 13, Christians are even commanded to go a step further and to pray for our leaders. How about that? Next time you hear somebody complaining about uh, uh, and the president, the governor, whoever, senators, whatever, um, you know, uh, stop and say, let's pray for that leader. All right? and, and I'm not, you know, not imprecatory prayers. Right? <laughs> God, strike him dead. No, um, but we're actually told we're to pray prayers of intercession and thanksgiving for our leaders. Ooh, how about them apples? Um, you know, next time you're complaining, stop and thank God for that leader. Pray for them, intercede for them right there and then, and see what God does to your heart. God put authority in our lives, and God can remove that authority from our lives. It's in his good timing. And David understood this and had a conviction in this, and, it, and he needed that conviction to push him through these times of vulnerability and weakness uh, to do the right thing. If you wait until you're being tempted to develop a conviction, it's too late. You need to develop convictions before you're tempted. Proverbs 16, 7, when a, when a man's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. That's a whale of a promise. Uh, <laughs> and as soon as you say, I'm going to live for God, get ready, you're going to step onto a battlefield. David's convictions uh, might have meant the long way, the painful way to the throne, but it was the right way. And in verse 8, we see the outwork of the principle. Uh, it says, Afterward, David also rose and went out of the cave and called after Saul, My Lord, the king. And when Saul looked behind him, David bowed with his face to the earth and paid homage. You see the language, you see the respect, you see the actions. His actions reveal his heart. Here's a man who's wicked, who's evil, who's trying to kill you for no good reason. And David is spread out in complete submission to this man. So David speaks. David said to Saul, why do you listen to the words of men who say, behold, David seeks your harm? This is fascinating. He is submissive. He is respectful, but it, he still speaks truth. He still speaks truth. Uh, we might be misunderstood and maligned by enemies, but submission to leadership does not mean that we abandon truth. Christians cannot disobey God and stay silent when people are being led astray by lies. And there are so many lies that, that are being spread uh, intentionally into our culture today. And, 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 you know, chief among them is a lie, well, Christians are anti-scientific, right? Uh, no, we worship the God who invented science, right? We have science on our side we have truth on our side. Um, you know, uh, abortion is not health care. Life begins a conception. God made us male and female. Sex is a blessing uh, to be enjoyed within marriage. Words have meaning. Uh, truth is not subjective. Nature follows a divine design. Evolution, it's a bad theory which breaks the laws of thermodynamics, okay? And, and you can go on and on. We're not anti-scientific. We embrace science because it helps us to better appreciate and understand God's creation. You know, when you see the miracles of God under a microscope, you just can't help but worship God for his power and his creativity for the way that he designed the world in which we live. And we don't need to be afraid of science uh, when science is the pursuit of truth. Right? And, and that's, again, another lie today, that science today is consensus. It's not. Right? Uh, science is the, is, the, uh, is the observable, you know, what you observe about, uh, about nature. Right? And so David is embracing truth and speaking truth to power. He wants all to understand the facts. And so he, he addresses him respectfully and then speaks truth. Verse 10, Behold, this day your eyes have seen how the Lord gave you today into my hand in the cave. And some told me to kill you, but I spared you. I said, I will not put out my hand against my Lord, for he is the Lord's anointed. See, my father, see the corner of your robe in my hand, for, for by the fact that I cut off the corner of your robe and did not kill you, you may know and see that there is no wrong or treason in my hands. I have not sinned against you, though you hunt my life to take it. Right, and, and this is important. He's not speaking the truth to the internet. He's not writing a meme post. He's not uh, starting a petition. He's not writing a, a blog or complaining or trying to convince Saul's men to join his side. He's speaking the truth to the one who needs to hear the truth. 
Then he says in verse 12, may the Lord judge between me and you. May the Lord avenge me against you, but my hand shall not be against you. As the proverb of the ancient says, out of the wicked comes wickedness, but my hand shall not be against you. After whom has the king of Israel come out? After whom do you pursue? After a dead dog? After a flea? May the Lord therefore be judge and give sentence between me and you and see to it and plead my cause and deliver me from your hand. Now, he's not taunting. He's not being sarcastic. He's not talking smack. He's a man of integrity. He knows God has made a promise and, 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 and Saul knows too. You know, even, even if he's, you know, and David doesn't know how he's going to make, how he's going to respond, but David is reminding Saul he's making commitment as conviction that he's going to trust God no matter what. He shares this proverb, uh, people are known by their fruits. David's done nothing wrong towards Saul. And he assures Saul, I, I, my hand will not be against you even in the future. Uh, and he says, everything has been exaggerated. I'm like a dead dog and a flea. Um, how can a king, a mighty man, be afraid of me? And so uh, David is, is speaking the truth with boldness, not knowing how Saul is going to respond. And in the same way, when you speak truth, you don't know how people are going to respond. In this case, though, it looks like Saul has listened. Verse 16, as soon as David had finished speaking these words to Saul, Saul said, is this your voice, my son David? Again, all, all before it was son of Jesse, son of Jesse, can't even say his name, and there's a softening here. Is this your voice, my son David? And Saul lifted up his voice and wept. He said to David, you are more righteous than I, for you have repaid me good, whereas I have repaid you evil. And you have declared this day how you have dealt well with me, and that you did not kill me when the Lord put me into your hands. For if a man finds his enemy, will he let him go away safe? So may the Lord reward you with good for what you have done to me this day. Wow. When a man's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. You know, we can't control the, the words, actions, opinions of others. All we can do is live the truth and tell the truth and leave the rest up to God. What happens next is amazing. Saul says in verse 20, And now behold, I know that you shall surely be king and that the kingdom of Israel shall be established in your hand. First time in scripture, Saul owns up to the truth. He's been told by Samuel, the king, his kingdom will not endure. Uh, he's been rejected as God's king. In chapter 18, he indicates David is so popular, the only thing left for him to do is possess the kingdom. Saul tells Jonathan he's going to never inherit the throne as long as David is alive. But here, for the first time, he acknowledges God is taking away his kingdom from him and giving it to David. This is certain, he says. And because he finally admits this, he asks a favor. Verse 21, swear to me. Swear to me, therefore, by the Lord, that you will not cut off my offspring after me, and that you will not destroy my name out of my father's house. In those days when kingdoms changed hands, they didn't let the king's family just hang around there. Uh, they would get rid of them. Uh, so David swore this to Saul. Um, he had already made this promise to Jonathan, actually, uh, but he does now to Saul. It says, then Saul went home, and David and his men went up to the stronghold. What an amazing story. You know, who would ever thought that, that nature's call results in another rescue of David by God? Powerful lesson about integrity uh, and about God's sovereignty in all things, even as something as basic and vulnerable as visiting the restroom. Uh, in this other throne room, God it was working. He rescued David and molded his heart. Um, Oswald Chambers, uh, in, in his book, Spiritual Leadership, gave, gave three principles for how leaders can ascertain or know God's will. Uh, and they're pretty easy to remember. Three S's, sovereignty, suffering, and servanthood. And, and we see these in David's life, and, and I think we can look for them in our own lives. Uh, the really good sovereignty uh, to recognize that it's God uh, that, that, that raises up and, and brings down. Saul, Saul raised, I'm sorry, God raised up Saul as Israel's king, even though Saul is rotten, he's imperfect, he is a king of the people's own choosing. They wanted a prideful, arrogant, strong man, and they got one. Uh, David man after God's own heart, knows what God ultimately wants for the nation and rightly understands that God is the one who's in control. 
Uh, and, and as long as Saul's in power, David is going to be obedient to God's word and his belief in God's sovereignty, and it keeps him from acting against Saul. What a lesson for us in political unrest today. Uh, next, suffering. Uh, suffering. O- Oswald Chambers uh, uh, shared that in one of his first sermons, right, this was after 60 years, uh, he said uh, this after his message that he heard two women talking about his sermon. And one woman said to the other, well, what'd you think? And the second woman responded, not bad, but he'll be better once he's suffered. <laughs> and, and, then, and then Sanders went on to describe how God brought him through suffering, that, that he, he lost a wife And then he remarried and lost another wife. And then he lost a niece. And and God had brought him through these things, and it changed him. And and suffering, nobody likes it, but we have to understand and have a theology of suffering that suffering changes us, and it changes our message. Uh, God, God brings David through suffering, and most of it at the hand of Saul. It's the school by which God is molding David for leadership. And God did the same thing for Joseph. God did the same thing for Moses. But like Satan did to Jesus in the wilderness, David's men are trying to tempt David to bypass suffering and take a shortcut to the the throne. And we too, we're we're being tempted to to avoid suffering, to avoid pain, to remove ourselves uh, from any discomfort by unfaithfulness to God. If you want an easy life, you know, don't live like a Christian. Right? Uh, Jesus never said, take up your bouquet of roses and follow me. Right? What did he say? Take up your what? Your cross and follow me. And so, so suffering is, is a necessary part of God's will for our lives. And uh, David is willing to suffer in order to obey God, even though he might not understand what God is doing through it at the time. Sovereignty, suffering, and third, servanthood. Servanthood and submission, they're, they're, they're linked together. Because uh, David is Saul's faithful servant, even uh, when, when Saul is seeking to take his life. And, and David understands that, that he can't be a true servant without submission. Submission to God, and also submission to this imperfect, uh, unholy, wicked king. And so he serves Saul faithfully. He doesn't compromise his convictions. He doesn't sin by serving Saul. In fact, the Holy Spirit pricks his conscience when he even cuts off a portion of his robe. Yeah. Uh, to David, he's like, this is not serving Saul faithfully. This is not what a, ser- a faithful servant does. And so he had developed a godly conviction to honor, to respect Saul. And, and what he did was not aligned with his conviction. And so he felt that remorse, that, 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 that moving the Holy Spirit in his heart, and he acted on it and restrained his men. So suffering is the price that David had to be willing to pay in order to serve Saul faithfully. And and those principles, sovereignty, suffering, and servanthood, they help David as he walks through life, even in the valleys of the shadow of death. He shared them with David's men, uh, and, 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 and David's men, just like Saul, they're basing their understanding of God's will based on their circumstances. Here's this opportunity in front of me. And it must be God's will. But David, not by circumstances, but by truth, by what is true, by principle. Uh, David chose to fight Goliath, not because of just the opportunity in front of him, but there was a theological. This man was blaspheming God. And so uh, it it was the 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 moving and and the, the, the threatening of his principles that led him to challenge Goliath. And so this is important for us. Too many Christians, we convince ourselves that my circumstances dictate what I do. And, and again, if you wait until you face temptation to develop your, circumst- your convictions, it's too late. David developed them early, and they were tested in that cave. Um, suffering. I, I hear a lot of Christians teach that suffering is not part of God's will. And, and, and the true faith is rewarded by immediate blessing in the absence of pain. No. And too many people, they, they choose favorable circumstances rather than living by faith. Uh, we, we get our, our guidance from other misguided Christians rather than standing on biblical principles. And so we need to be uh, men and women of God who, like David, have a heart that pursues God's heart for his glory and for his good. Right? Uh, 
God matters. I don't matter. God matters. So what's more important, my principles or my circumstances? Uh, Jesus illustrated this too. He had every opportunity to walk away from the cross, didn't he? At the start of his ministry, he could have listened to Satan, bypassed the cross, gotten the glory. In the garden, he could have fought alongside of Peter, picked up a sword. He could have defended his innocence in front of Pilate. But Jesus was guided not by the opportunities in front of him, but by the sovereign will of God, his willingness to suffer, and his faithful servanthood. Christ served us through his sacrifice on the cross. Let's close in prayer. Father, I thank you, Lord, for this um, reminder and this powerful lesson of, of convictions being tested about suffering, about sovereignty, about how our, our love for you guides us even through those dark times in our life. So, Lord, I pray that you'd help us as your church be faithful. Lord, I pray for anybody, too, that um, is going through a valley and is experiencing suffering, Lord, and um, are doing it without conviction and without any hope because they don't have you as part of their lives. And Lord, if you're bringing them through, through pain, um, maybe it's so that they will stop looking around them for help and finally look up. And if that's you, if, if you have no place to look but up, maybe that is God calling you. Maybe that is God asking you to trust him. Maybe that is God uh, wanting to convince you and, and demonstrate to you his love by offering the salvation that was purchased for you when Jesus died on the cross for sin. And so just between you and God, at this moment, you can get right with God. Repent of your sin and turn to him. You can pray to him right now. God, I've sinned against you and I'm sorry. Forgive me. I believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sin. I believe he rose from the grave and I ask Jesus, be Lord of my life. Take control and save me. Lord, I don't want to walk this life alone. I don't want to deal with the, 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 the pain and disappointment. I want to have purpose and have my life glorify you. And so, Father, use me for your glory. Help me to be a vessel of your love. Help me to change this world by loving those that you've put into my life. Father, that's our prayer for us as a church, that we would be lighthouses in a dark place, that your love would shine from us, uh, that we would not be guided by circumstances, but by principles, by truth that we would be bold with our faith and, and make a difference uh, by demonstrating to this world that we serve a living God, a God that changes hearts, that brings hope. And Father, as, as we close this, this time together, Lord, we pray that you might give us opportunities this week to demonstrate that love. I pray, Lord, for those that are struggling with a sin in their lives, that they've been feeling that prick of the Holy Spirit, that they would have the boldness and the courage to do as David did. And even though it hurts, even though there's pain, even though it might mean suffering, that they would get right with you and get right with others. Give them the courage to do that. Not so that we might be glorified, but that you might use us as your vessels of your love. We ask this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen.